Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Lab Grown Diamonds Past, Present and Future. My name is John Pollard and I'm Senior Director of Education for the International Gemological Institute, an educational advisor for Pricescope.com and your host for Pricescope's In The Loop webinar series. By way of introduction, Pricescope is the world's largest diamond and jewelry community, attracting more than 400,000 unique visitors per month with a search engine that lists over a million diamonds from the world's most recognized, respected, and reputable online sellers. The Pricescope Forum has over 100,000 registered users. It's an interactive community of jewelry enthusiasts who offer education and advice to new shoppers for no compensation, simply because they love diamonds, jewelry, and helping other people. If you're not yet a member, you can register today and join the Pricescope community. Today's session will address a hot topic in the world of diamonds and jewelry, one which I believe has brought new energy to the industry, stimulating professionals in all sectors to focus on strengthening their various value propositions. The topic is lab-grown diamonds. Now, this session is not going to rehash the old pro and con arguments. If you want to know the basics, visit the Pricescope education page on lab-grown diamonds when this session is over. The basics are covered there. Today we're looking at what's already happened and potentially where we're headed. Throughout the session, we invite your questions. We've scheduled time to address them at the end. You can send them via the Q&A tool at any time. We also have live chat and we encourage you to participate in the show within the show, uh, which is the chat feature. So we hope you will chat with each other while we're presenting the webinar. Let's begin with the genesis of lab-grown diamonds and two disruptive developments which, put, uh, which pushed things in that sector forward. We could do an entire webinar on history, but we'll keep it short today, just the origin stories and some key developments. The term laboratory grown comes from attempts to create diamonds in research laboratories. There were companies that achieved diamond synthesis in 1952 and 1953 but the history-making breakthrough was achieved by General Electric in December of 1954. That's when a gentleman named Tracy Hall successfully synthesized industrial diamonds. Now, fun fact number one, General Electric made the announcement on February 15th, 1955, the day after Valentine's Day. And fun fact number two, for this incredible historical breakthrough achievement, General Electric rewarded Mr. Hall with a $10 savings bond, and he quit. In fact, this photograph of Tracy Hall shows a different diamond press than the one he created at GE because the United States government got wind of his invention and classified his own research so that he couldn't use it. That didn't matter, you can't suppress genius. After working a research job at Brigham Young University for some years, Mr. Hall started his own company and wound up inventing the cubic press system, which today produces the world's largest lab-grown rough diamonds. Another important development that took place at the dawn of lab-grown diamond creation uh, relates to industry news today. Now remember, General Electric announced successful diamond synthesis in 1955. And in 1956, a company called Adamant Research Laboratory was founded. It took them only three years to successfully synthesize industrial diamonds. And for those who don't know, the man who launched that company was Harry Oppenheimer, the newly minted chairman of De Beers. That's right, De Beers entered the lab-grown diamond game the moment General Electric's breakthrough occurred. Side note, adamant research is an interesting play on words, since adamus is the Greek word for diamond, and the definition of adamant is refusing to change one's mind. By the 1960s, the De Beers Industrial Diamond Division was successfully producing and selling a range of industrial lab-grown diamond grit and grinding products. In the year 2002, following a series of breakthroughs in chemical vapor deposition, that's CVD growth technology, the company name was changed to Element 6. Now their output 
portfolio steadily expanded over the next 16 years from 2002 to 2018 with the addition of lab-grown super materials for the automotive, technological, and aerospace industries. That brings us to the first disruptor. In 2005, IGI, the International Gemological Institute, broke new ground by accepting, analyzing, and fully grading lab-grown diamonds. That had not been done before by another institute. This landmark event provided the industry's first footholds in acknowledgement of the viability and authenticity of this product for a small industry segment which had not previously gained much traction. Within six years, market vol volume worldwide had surpassed a million carats. The amount of gem quality lab-grown diamonds produced since then has only gained momentum, bringing us to the second disruptor, which occurred in 2018. That's when Element 6 and De Beers announced Lightbox Jewelry. Now, this began as a collection of finished earrings, necklaces, and bracelets set with gem quality lab grown. Naturally, there were fears that Lightbox Jewelry would cannibalize natural diamond bridal sales. This was softened somewhat by a limit on the brand's gemstone. Uh, they only weighed one carat or less, and further softened by the brand's focus on studs, wrists, and neckwear only. Nevertheless, there were two undeniable game changers. First, the Lightbox product came to market at a relatively low price point, even compared to loose lab-grown diamonds being sold in stores and online at the time. And second, going against industry tradition, excuse me, Going against industry tradition, Lightbox Jewelry was offered at retail for a flat rate of $800 per carat. So, a pair of half-carat earrings cost $400, regardless of color. A pair of one-carat earrings cost $800, and so on. Now, since the initial launch, De Beers has widened the range of their Lightbox product. They still don't market to the bridal sector. They still don't use the same color and clarity grading scale, identifying colorless, identifying uh, loop clean, uh, but their portfolio is expanding. That brings us to the present and a look at more recent times. What's coming, what's occurring, why, and where and how is it happening? Here's what's occurring. In terms of millions of carats, we know that total market volume grew 20% from 2019 to 2020, and about the same from 2020 to 2021. Now, what's interesting is the makeup of what's coming to market. IGI has shared st uh, these statistics from their 20 laboratory locations. Now, the Institute has continued to dominate the lab-grown market becoming the first lab to hold ISO accreditation for both natural and lab-grown diamond grading. What's interesting is this, where overall market volume increased 20% year-on-year, the number of lab-grown diamonds submitted for grading across IGI's network grew even more, between 50 to 75% in volume in 2020, depending on location, and as much as 150% in 2021. Through the first half of 2022, that volume has continued to increase, though not as dramatically as 2021. What this means would seem to be growing sophistication in lab-grown diamond output, larger stones, higher colors and clarities, more stones finishing as grown. Essentially, as overall volume increases, the percentage of output producers find worthy of sending for a grading report is also increasing even faster. Now, this data does not cover 100% of lab-grown diamonds, but I believe it's representative, particularly for price scope. Uh, over 95% of lab-grown diamonds listed in the search engine here passed through an IGI laboratory. That brings us to why. Why the growth? According to industry statistician Edan Golan, there appears to be a parallel increase in the share of lab-grown diamond sales and the reduction of natural diamond sales. Now, with that said, from Tiffany to Signet, natural diamond sellers have also enjoyed surging sales in recent years. Speaking of bridal specifically, 
if more people are adopting lab grown it may reflect the diversity in mindset among younger buyers for natural diamonds the organic forever symbolism and the romance should continue to hold a strong value proposition in the bridal market going forward nevertheless according to my millennial and generation z nieces they would gladly accept either product if it came from the right proposer continuing to chase the why question why more volume why more sales well more and more sustainable lab grown diamonds do exist on the macro most of them cannot be claimed to be sustainable because the burning of fossil fuels is used to produce them and they require a lot of energy however there are all grow there are growers who are using hydro, solar, and wind, and getting a sustainability certification. SCS standards, uh, they're a sustainability leader across many sectors, developed the SCS 007 sustainability certification for diamond producers. That's natural diamond producers can earn it as well as lab-grown diamond producers. There are a number of lab-grown reaching into this, and it's reaching young consumers. Additionally, there are even diamonds being created from atmospheric carbon capture technology. Now, those finished stones are not simply carbon neutral or sustainable, they're carbon negative. So there are a number of interesting why factors which exist and there are more in development. Simply put, natural diamond sellers will always have the upper hand in terms of organic emotional symbolism. With that said, forward thinkers in the lab grown sector are finding ways to appeal to other human values. This brings us to the where and the how. This graphic from last year gives you an idea of where lab-grown diamonds are produced and what share are CVD versus HPHT. Now, those two terms, HPHT is high pressure, high temperature. Essentially, and this was the Tracy Hall breakthrough with GE, it's using heat and pressure to produce diamonds the same way that they were produced in the earth. CVD is chemical vapor deposition. It's another process which we're going to touch on in a few slides. They are very different ways of producing lab-grown diamonds. The time of this slide, China was dominating, producing nearly half of the world's output with India, Singapore, and the United States all producing a million carats or more. Do note that the majority are produced using the CVD process. This becomes important as we move into the future. As with the past, the future may be shaped by disruptive developments. I'd like to do some show and tell, meaning we're going to start with some eye-pleasing images and video showing paradigm-shifting diamond products, and then I'll tell you some technical information revealing how some new directions are possible, and some old directions are a little more complicated. These may directly inform jewelry design in the future. I'd like to begin with videos of two recent lab-grown diamond creations. Each video is about 30 seconds long. We're going to begin with a piece of finished jewelry featuring a 13.28 carat fancy vivid blue freeform modified brilliant cut inspired by the palm-shaped hamsa. Now for the technically minded, the stone you just saw has a 20.53 millimeter spread and a 3.33 millimeter depth, which is a total depth percentage of 16.2%. Next comes another unique shape.
Yaman. As you saw, it's an 8.96 carat fancy intense green, partially faceted and laser etched lab grown diamond inspired by the cannabis plant. It has an 18.05 millimeter spread and a 3.25 millimeter depth for a total depth percentage of 18%. As you might imagine, few people have seen diamonds cut to these shapes before. Very few of us have seen a 10 karat stone with an 82% table and 15.5% total depth before, and yet those parameters are something these new shapes have in common. So that brings us to disruptor number one, which is the shape of lab-grown diamond rough produced with chemical vapor deposition, or CVD. For reference, the majority of natural rough diamond crystals are octahedral or dodecahedral in shape. And there are exceptions, but this is the rule. As a result, for thousands of years, natural diamonds have been planned and cut to maximize depth for best yield from the rough. Even today, with advanced sawing and girdling, most natural diamond rough is planned to produce well-known shapes like round brilliant, which incorporate a certain amount of depth to facilitate yield. Now, there are exceptions. Twinned crystals, called mackles, and rough that gets broken in the recovery process are used to produce uh, shallow shapes, but the centuries-old practice with natural diamond rough is to create some depth. As a result, the most common natural diamonds in the marketplace, antiques, rounds, cushions, princess, you name it, have had depths in the 60% range or above. These depths are also most practical for HPHT lab-grown diamond rough since the HPHT process replicates the natural process. Now let's talk about how CVD works. CVD stands for chemical vapor deposition. It takes place in a vacuum chamber starting with a flat substrate of diamond seed placed at the bottom. The chamber is injected with hydrocarbon and hydrogen gases. Microwaves are used to heat the gases into plasma, causing hydrogen and carbon atoms to separate from their nuclei. Those atoms rain down from above. The hydrogen atoms actually clean the substrate, picking off existing hydrogen atoms, leaving an empty spot that allows carbon atoms to come down and bond with the existing carbon atoms, crystallizing as a new layer of new diamond on top of the underlying layer. As the carbon rain keeps coming, the atoms keep bonding, and the crystal keeps growing layer by layer. At the end of the process, you have a lab-grown diamond which grew vertically. Here's a look at the CVD process in action with a time lapse on the left and a plate of diamond substrates on the right. Now what you're seeing here is actual diamond growth using energy to crystallize diamond atom by atom. If you're a nerd like me, it's pretty cool to watch. The end result is cube-shaped diamond rough crystals. And this has several interesting implications for the future. Since the shape of CVD rough is equally or better suited to shallow shapes, it opens a new world of possibilities for diamond design and allows for greater frequency of traditional shapes such as heart, marquee, etc. Second, for round brilliance, shallower proportions uh, sets make sense. Intriguingly, the shallow end of most excellent or ideal cut grades tends to result in greater brightness than proportions near the deep end of those grades. To that end, Gary Holloway, the Australian gemologist, has an interesting forecast about chain stores that are carrying both, uh, both lab-grown and natural diamonds in commercial qualities. He predicts that if the average shopper visits a jeweler at the mall that's offering both natural and lab-grown, and the lab-grown diamonds are more affordable and brighter than their natural counterparts, lower quality natural goods may not be practical to produce. <clears throat> the third implication is more speculative, but it's worth mentioning. Large CVD-grown diamonds may cost less to bring to market than small lab-grown diamonds. Let me say that again. Larger diamonds may cost less to produce than smaller. Here's how that works. If you grow a CVD slab to three millimeters deep, it will yield half carat round brilliance. 
If you grow it to six millimeters deep, it actually takes less than twice as long when you include setup time, but that rough will yield a four carat stone instead of a half carat. The end result is one stone, one labor cost to polish, and one grading report, as opposed to several stones with polishing costs and multiple grading report charges. Now, ultimately, depending on the sophistication of the equipment, the cost could be lower per carat for larger stones. And speaking of that word sophistication, here is a producer growing CVD rough in a pyramid shape, which reduces waste when polishing the most popular shapes. This company, based in Israel, is Lusix, the world's first 100% solar-powered lab-grown diamond producer. They market their diamonds as sun-grown. I can also answer a question that was asked on the forum regarding investment capital. There is a lot of investment going into China as new Chinese operations are inviting uh, venture capitalism. But Lusix made news last month when LVMH, the Louis Vuitton luxury group, invested close to $100 million in their operations. It's the first luxury brand to invest in a lab-grown diamond producer that has interesting and possibly disruptive future implications. So that's your first disruptor. The shape of CVD grown rough presents a new class and category of possibilities ahead. <clears throat> Excuse me. Disruptor number two is the proliferation of fancy colors. We can sta start with lab-created diamonds which finish as grown. Now this has become something of a delineator in the world of lab-grown diamonds. Currently, most lab-grown diamonds undergo some post-growth treatment to enhance their color, either to make them more colorless or in fancy colors to make them more saturated. IGI identifies diamonds which finish as grown on the laboratory grown diamond report. We further identify which growth process was used and provide some indication of diamond type. While these are not part of the traditional four C's, we have identified them as value factors that people want to know. Uh, as a result, in the comments section for every lab grown diamond, those things are identified. Here are some modern examples as grown using the high pressure, high temperature process. Now what as grown means is that the rough emerged from the capsule uh, with these hues needing no additional enhancement. This is a look at HPHT diamond presses and some rough HPHT output, colorless as well as colored. As mentioned, it resembles natural rough in depth. And this isn't related to color, but it is cool. This is laser coning. Now the rough gets pre-sawed and even blocked by laser. Now for cross-working and brillianteering, they go to the standard diamond polishing wheel. And once on the wheel, they are polished into traditional shapes. Now at the laboratory, we are seeing increasing color saturation and increasing sizes, as you can see with the seven, eight, and 11 karat blues here. There we go. Incidentally, these three diamonds were created by Mailer Global, a producer of the largest Guinness World Record rough lab grown diamonds to date. Uh, the company is Ukrainian. They operate out of Kyiv. So now let's talk about color enhancements. What we've seen so far is as grown. We've all heard about treatments used to remove or improve color over history. As technology advances, we're seeing more sophistication in these treatments, not simply through annealing or secondary pressure and temperature, but also through ionizing radiation. For example, two years ago at IGI New York, a 10.06 carat fancy intense yellow that we had graded before came back to us as, surprise, a 10.06 carat fancy vivid pink. That's right, these are the same diamond. Our analysis determined that the color was shifted from yellow to pink using an electron beam. I want to take this moment to touch on transparency and disclosure. Uh, at the lab, we can easily separate natural diamonds from lab-grown. 
We're also well equipped to determine original growth method and detect when diamonds have had further treatments. Here's the analysis of that diamond with visible spectroscopy. The peak indicated at 595 nanometers indicates irradiation. That's the 5 MeV electron beam. The second, even higher peak at 637 indicates the stone's nitrogen vacancy center, which is typical of diamonds treated to become pink. Additionally, the HPHT process uses a metal catalyst to dissolve carbon. Some HPHT produced diamonds finish with the remnants of the metal catalyst inside, which didn't fully melt. Now, such inclusions have a man-made or even reflective appearance, unlike any naturally occurring inclusion. The bottom line, instead of a fancy, intense yellow lab-grown diamond, electron beam technology gave us a 10-carat fancy vivid pink, which is much rarer across the board. <clears throat> I'd like to look at this disruptor in a little bit more detail, meaning an assortment and high saturation of fancy colors uh, that are coming to market at extremely affordable prices. Uh, before I queue up this video, I do want to say if you have any questions, no matter how basic, uh, it can be absolutely anything on this topic, please submit them via the Q&A. Uh, we're going to answer everything uh, at the end, so it doesn't have to be about electron beams. It can be as simple as, are these real diamonds? Uh, we'll answer that question uh, if you would like us to. As you watch this last video, you designers and creatives out there, I'm sure you can probably imagine ways to incorporate products like these in trad traditional designs or even something groundbreaking and new. Oh, that's a bummer. Let's try that again. If you like the videos you're seeing in this webinar, I need to make a shameless plug uh, to subscribe to the IGI Gem blog. Uh, the subscription is easy and once per week you'll get an email that just links to that week's posts. If you're interested, you can subscribe at IGI.org slash gemblog. IGI is a price scope supporter. That brings us to the final chapter of today's webinar information presentation. Now, I was born into Generation X. So for me, industrial diamonds used to imply drill bits, machine, and cutting tools, but technology has come a long way. Today's industrial diamonds include type 2A flawless plates, anvils, and lenses at quality levels which actually exceed what's used in jewelry. 25% of lab-grown output already goes towards diodes, transistors, and sensors. In fact, whatever device you're using to watch this webinar would not exist without lab-grown diamonds. They're being used in medicine for imaging systems, joint replacements, now spinal disc replacements. 
Lab-grown diamond lenses function under extremely high thermal and radiation loads with a low coefficient for linear expansion, advancing spectroscopy, X-ray, IR, and other technologies. And finally, we have quantum entanglement now. Buckle your seat belts for this. In 2019, researchers in Japan entangled two particles within lab-grown diamonds at the quantum level. The result, any influence on one particle instantaneously steers the other into an identical state no matter where it is. Now the key words there having to do with quantum physics as opposed to classical physics are instant, uh, instantaneously and no matter where it is. That means no time delay across any distance. In the future, just imagine quantumly entangled phones. A user could type a message on one and it would appear instantly on the other, even across thousands of light years. Successful quantum entanglement and non-locality realized in lab-grown diamonds provides us with a theoretical basis for actualizing science fiction concepts like subspace communications, transporters, and even exploring the quantum realm. And while I'm a lover, not a fighter, it also suggests the possibility of coded military communications at a transcendent level with no possibility of interception or distance restriction on planet Earth or beyond. In summary, as we watch lab-grown diamond developments in the jewelry world, be aware that the end game for the most sophisticated lab-grown diamond producers is not your ears, your fingers, or your wrists. Their end game is to land billion or trillion dollar contracts with the likes of Apple, Pfizer, Raytheon, or possibly the governments of entire nations, depending on what lies ahead. That's my presentation. Uh, before we go to the Q&A, these webinars are made possible by PriceScope sponsors who are literally some of the most well-known and reputable names in the business. You can find a list of them on the featured vendors page. All right, let's go ahead and uh, get to the questions. I see we've got a number of questions that have come in already. I'm going to go ahead and answer a couple of them that were posted on the forum uh, in advance. Um, <clears throat> the first one was, what do you see as the future uh, for as-grown fancy colored lab diamonds? There are still some as-grown HPHT blues floating around, but the majority of blues are treated. My favorite, the oranges, are pretty much all gone. Okay, my answer to this, completely my opinion, but I believe the as-grown distinction is going to hold up for colorless for fancy colors, I'm not sure treatments carry the same stigma. Uh, in the past, you had to be royalty, Bill Gates, or Jeff Bezos to afford a fancy red diamond of high saturation and size. Now, I can buy a fancy red lab-grown diamond for my wife. Now, will she care if they used an electron beam after growing it in a plasma chamber? Uh, I'm not sure but I'll be sure to use a price scope vendor uh, when I give it to her because uh, they'll have a good return policy. Also, um, orange is hard. Uh, you know, it involves uh, affecting the crystal structure. Uh, orange is, a, my understanding, is a tricky color. And the science guys who are, who are creating these color transitions understand it a lot better than I do. But I, knew that, I do know that that's a difficult one. So it'll be interesting to see if we can get um, uh, more oranges on board. Next question. <clears throat> Several producers claim there's a proprietary growth process for their stones. They're better, they have cleaner hues, etc. Is there or will there be a golden or more transparent standard for lab stones qualities and attributes and when should we expect that? It's a great question. It's a two-part answer. First, this is technology. So like video, somebody at the top is going to come out with 1080p and then somebody else at the top introduces 4k and so on. However, unlike video, Lower quality gemstones don't necessarily become obsolete because they're adornment. They become lower priced. So while the technology ceiling keeps getting raised, as long as um, new players enter the game, there's still going to be a wide range of quality. Uh, some people entering the game are trying to convert industrial presses to gem quality. So this, they don't have the high quality output. In CVD, 
it's easy to have contaminants uh, starting materials can be corrupted so <clears throat> while the ceiling gets higher the basement's not necessarily going away like in video uh, we're headed towards 8k now but you're going to still find 360 and 480p out there uh, as to the second part of that um, there are treatment patron, patents rather which are expiring which is going to open the door for more improvement for producers who apply post-growth treatments. Okay, where do colored lab-grown diamonds come from? What colors are available? Well, the colors that are available are literally all colors of the rainbow, some more available than others. Uh, where they come from are, uh, some of them are as grown and others are undergoing very sophisticated treatments. So it's not a, there's not a single answer for that. Uh, some lab-grown producers are not focusing on color right now, uh, others are. You can find them, though, in the inventories of the price scope sellers. Uh, will the color fade over time? No, it will not fade over time. Next question. For resale value, is it still smarter to purchase a natural diamond? Yes. Um, in terms of resale value, it's an interesting question because natural diamonds not only are do they hold value do understand by the way let's let's back up and let me let me enter this question again the best thing you can do as a natural diamond buyer if you're a consumer and not a part of the trade is to look at the upgrade policies or buyback policies that the seller offers the typical consumer is surprised to find out that if they were to take their natural diamond and walk to a jeweler a year or two years or three years later, they can only recover around 30% selling it to a jeweler over the counter. So the value of natural diamonds, while it, it absolutely tracks, it increases over time, um, it's a little bit of an illusion without a trade-up policy. If you have a trade-up policy, which you can return your diamond five, 10 years from now, a year from now, and they'll apply 100% of what you purchase towards a new purchase, whether it's unrestricted and you can get anything new or uh, restricted, you have to spend twice as much. That has a lot of value in the natural diamond world. For lab-grown diamonds, there are uh, some sellers that are now offering policies where they will, what you paid for it uh, when you come back in uh, in the future, they will give you what it's worth on that day meaning that if you buy a one carat GVS2 in 2019 and it's worth $2,500 less uh, in 2022, they will give you credit for the same stone, the one carat GVS2, towards something else, but it's not going to be the same dollar amount. I hope I made that clear. If I didn't, uh, hit me again in the, in the questions. Uh, another question. Is there a reason not to buy a lab-grown diamond? If you're buying for yourself, I don't see if, if, if you like the lab-grown product, then there's no problem. I would say be sure that if you do have a partner and this is going to be a gift, make sure you're on the same page in terms of philosophy. There are people who consider uh, lab-grown diamonds basically fakes. Now, we know they're not fake technically, but uh, I would prefer if I'm going to gift something that the recipient, uh, that it brings the recipient joy. Next question, is CVD the better option when purchasing a lab-grown diamond? HPHT and CVD, the, the players at the very top, um, it's like imagine uh, two uh, high-end automotive companies, Mercedes, BMW. Uh, at the very top, there is no advantage or disadvantage to one or the other. Um, at the bottom of each, they each have their own challenges. So your choice of seller uh, when it comes to a lab-grown diamond is just like uh, it has the importance that you do for a natural diamond. Um, the choice of seller, they're going to know where to go for the quality level that you want. If you want to stipulate one or the other, that's fine. Um, but the bottom line is at the top, there is no advantage or disadvantage to either production method. Next question, does a jeweler need to be concerned about how much heat is used setting a colored lab-grown diamond? No. The color treatments uh, are permanent as it relates to jeweler's torches. Next question. What percentage of lab diamonds are used for jewelry versus industry? Ooh, great question. I don't have the answer to that, but I know that industrial uh, applications are still, the, the range is crazy, right? You have grit, 
that's used for polishing wheels, industrial grit, and then you have the the 2A flawless lenses that I was uh, was talking about. Um, it's a great question, and I don't have an answer. Can you trace where a lab-grown diamond came from? This is also something interesting. There are now lab-grown producers who want origin reporting on the grading reports. And as long as they can demonstrate origin reporting and sustainability, by the way, uh, IGI will indeed uh, put the sustainability rating down and we will report origin. There are, uh, we see the United States sellers and some of the sellers in Israel uh, and the UK actually being the first to, to want this origin reporting. Um, but the bottom line is, if you're buying it generic from, um, uh, there's not really a way to know uh, unless that is included as part of the, the chain of custody. So if it's on the cert, then you can know. Uh, without that, you could ask your seller. Uh, and if they've sourced it directly from a producer, they could tell you what country that producer is based in. Okay, next question. Is getting a lab diamond certified or insured any different than for a natural diamond? Um, at present, it's not, although you need to speak to your insurer to make sure that they're, they're in that business. The, the jewelry specific insurers uh, are, but talk to them about those policies. What's the best tester to get that is under $10,000? <clears> well, first of all, let me just say that the electric testers based on electricity do not work. Uh, and there's uh, a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the newer UV testers are the ones that are best for professionals. However, what you should be aware of is that none of these testers, you don't put a diamond in, press a button, and it comes up and tells you this is lab grown or this is natural. You have to make a determination. You have to look at the stones, and it's all based on UV, so the color of the the fluorescence essentially, the color of, of the light waves being emitted from the stone is a clue to its nature. And in some cases, it's not decisive. Now, our concierge lead uh, says that depends on the user, but the $5,000 GIA tester is great for appraisers, perhaps not best for a manufacturer. Uh, the gem pen from Gemometrics is also very useful at around $2,500. Uh, I would just say the, the Sherlock is um, an industry standard among jewelers who are looking to, to get those as well. All right, and the last question I have, uh, lab diamonds from D to J color are type 2A, but what types are all the remainder? Are they all 2A or do the types vary as color changes? That's a very high level question. Um, and I will tell you that typing is uh, super important the vast majority are type 2A, but there are also type 2B, and there are some which are very difficult to determine. Um, I would kick that back to the lab, and I'm going to come back to the price scope thread. So bookmark the thread on price scope about this webinar because I will have a better answer to that question once I consult the geniuses back at the laboratory. Okay, um, I'm just going to take a look here at the chat and see if there's anything else going on. Uh, all right, anything else? I think we may be done here. Uh, I want to thank everybody for um, coming today. This is a, a really a, a fun one for me to do uh, just because there's so much new information and the information is going to change. We'll probably need to do this webinar again in another year. So thank you again for to everybody for joining us here. Um, we will see you down the road in the future and be sure to uh, look for our next webinar when it happens. Take care.